I'll get back to that later. Okay, so we have to, if you want to learn a bit more about how meditation fits in, in, into the, the Buddhist ideas about life or how, what is the philosophy of, behind meditation as you have practiced it today, then we have to start first with the person who discovered meditation. And this has actually not been a very easy discovery as any discovery will be, will require some sacrifice, will require some creativity to, to occur. And um, in this case uh, also. So the Buddha as we know him today was actually originally known as Prince Siddhartha. And you may have heard of that. There was also a well-known book by a, a writer called Hermann Hesse about him called Siddhartha. And so uh, at that time, um, he was born uh, as Prince Siddhartha in what is now known as, uh, uh, what, what is now known as India or Nepal. The scholars are not quite sure where it is exactly. And that was Kapilavatu. And that was, um, he was born as a prince and uh, he was, he was a sort of, uh, you could say also he was royalty. It wasn't exactly prince as we think of it as in the West. And he was predicted to renounce the throne. His father uh, wanted, uh, you, I should start with the beginning, when, when he, was, he was just born, the, there was a tradition that a number of wise people were looking at the, at the, the baby and they would make a prediction about what he would be like in the future. And there was a prediction made that he in the future would leave the palace behind. And this was also confirmed later when he as a child started to develop an interest in meditation, which is rather unusual for a child of his age. At that time, he was only seven years old. So he started to ask himself questions and ask himself, uh, about the meaning of life and his father found it more and more difficult to stop him from thinking about leaving the palace life behind and trying to find uh, meaning in spiritual or, or some sort of life as a clergyman or some sort of life as a mendicant or religious person. So his father wasn't able to hide the, the suffering of life for him. So in Buddhist legend, this is symbolized by, or this is expressed, depicted as a, as a traditional story goes that he was, would one day uh, would meet, uh, go into the city and then see for the first time a pers an old person, a sick person and a dead person, and then ask himself the question, will I also one day be grow old, become sick and die. And then finally his father, uh, I mean, he, he, his uh, charioteer, his driver, he said to him, well, you, you will have to grow old, become sick and die just like anyone else, sir. And then therefore he had to make, uh, he, he started to wonder about that. And this indicates the profundity, the very profundity, which is the basic notion of Buddhism that everything, everything spiritual starts with the realization that our life is still incomplete somehow, that we need to work on ourselves, on our mind and our character to improve ourselves in meditation and the training of the mind and to improve ourselves in our daily habits. So, uh, oh, sorry about that. Um, so he, event he eventually became a monk and left the palace behind that was, as was predicted. And then he came to conclusion that we all suffer in life. And you may have heard of it before because it's the sort of thing that you might learn when you have a basic course about Buddhism or a basic subject about Buddhism uh, on the secondary school or perhaps even uh, on, in college or something like that. So he, he, when the Buddha explained uh, the word suffering, you could think of several things. You could think of physical suffering, the suffering of earning a living. Some people find it hard to get a good job or to, to 
get themselves get enough finances to get enough funds for their children and their partner. The suffering of living in society, which is living in, in, in communion or in, in, in a community with other people, we always have to sometimes deal with conflict. This is part of life. But the more deeper suffering, which Prince Siddhartha, who later became what is known as the Buddha, who was known as the Buddha, he discovered something more deeper, that there is a suffering of the defilements which control our mind. And I talked about this previous times. Can you remember? So there is a habit and our mind tends to wander all the time. It tends to drift off and we find uh, delight here and there, but we cannot really find happiness. Our mind tends to drift off and drift off. It wanders and wanders and wanders. It's difficult to control, but it's possible. This is what the Buddha uh, discovered and taught. It's possible to train the mind, but if you do not do so, then our minds will suffer. Yeah. Recently in a, in a study done by Harvard, they actually had people uh, use um, indicate uh, online through an application how they were at that what were they were doing at the time how they felt about it and how distracted they were maybe you've heard of that study it was kind of promoted a lot on the on the news and they discovered that it doesn't really matter what you do if you're working in at a, at a conveyor belt in the factory which is perhaps not the most interesting job or working at Amazon or something like that, which is very hard work. Uh, then, uh, or you are working in a very relaxing, intellectually challenging job or something like that. They discovered that it doesn't really matter what you do, but much more important than that is how distracted you are. So it doesn't, so people are not so much affected by what they're doing in the terms of how happy they are, but they are affected by um, their distractedness. Sorry, how much they are distracted is affecting how happy they are and how much they suffer. This was an interesting study which actually confirms what is uh, widely known in, in, in um, the philosophy behind meditation, Buddhist meditation, that we all uh, suffer because the mind is wandering. And if we learn to tame our mind, we have just discovered the main reason, the main cause, the main method to find happiness in life. So it's interesting for many Buddhists that that was confirmed by a Harvard study, but it doesn't really change much. But uh, it's still interesting though. It's also interesting that they tried to do a study about people being distracted and then came up with an application which probably only made them more distracted. <laughs> um, so uh, let's go back to the presentation. So we already talked about the nature of the mind last time. Do you remember? Perhaps not. So the mind often wanders and because of that we suffer but it's possible to do something about it. It's not easy, but it's possible. To be exact, our, our abbot and teacher in Thailand, he, used, he usually says that it's, it's not easy and it's not difficult to train the mind in meditation. It's manageable. It's manageable and when it's manageable, we can, and we start to manage it, then it won't be hard. So these are his words, and I think that's very well said. Okay. So last time we talked about uh, how the mind, when it's affected uh, by outside objects, by outside sensory experiences, then the mind uh, will be like a pool of mud, which is stirred up and from changes from a clear pool of water into a pool of mud. So if you have a pool of water in which there is some sand or some sediment and you start, you step into that pool of water, even if it's very clear water, 
then it will, will quickly become murky or muddy. So the same way the mind works like that as well. If our mind is com continually moving around, then our mind will, apart from it not being happy, it will also uh, be very well possible that three things happen in our mind. Greed, hatred, oh, sorry. Greed, hatred, and delusion. And these are called the defilements that I mentioned before. So these are the things that, according to the philosophy of Buddhist meditation, make us suffer. If we deal with these three, we can learn to become happy. And we do that also by developing, developing the opposites of these three. For example, greed, its opposite is generosity, or its opposite is um, letting go. Hatred has as its opposite tolerance, patience, and also compassion, kindness. Delusion is usually associated in the West with uh, mental illness, but it doesn't mean that here. It, here it means that the mind is not seeing things as it really is. So we can overcome this by wisdom, by developing wisdom, developing better understanding, and also developing respect for our for for good teachings and good teachers. So this is uh, these are the three major causes, or what is sometimes known in Buddhism as the true enemies of humankind, or you could say also the true illnesses of the mind, but that. That is rather confusing in, in the Western context. So this is the reason why we, according to Buddhism, we suffer. So if you wonder why does meditation make me so happy, apart from the part of aspect of relaxation, what is actually happening in your mind as well is that the mind is becoming more and more settled. When it's becoming more and more settled, the, the, the negative emotions like greed, hatred, and delusion and also the unrealistic perceptions of delusion, they cannot affect you so much anymore. It's like they're still there, but they don't come up so much. Uh, so uh, because in meditation, we create a lot of space, we create a lot of space and openness to develop good qualities. So one teacher, is in fact our deputy, ab deputy abbot in, in Thailand. He said that uh, you can compare meditation sometimes, you can compare it with uh, driving a car with a gear, you call it a gear in, in English, right? Yes. Do you still use gears in America or is that all automatic these days? No, I still use gears. You still use gears, sir? Huh? Some. Okay, okay. Um, so, so in in in, uh, in Holland these days, people are gradually switching to automatic, but we are still a bit slow because of some bad advertising decisions in the past. They used to advertise automatic cars by saying that they're very very good for old people. That was not a good decision. So <laughs> when we are using a gear, we are putting it in neutral to move. Uh, backward, right? You cannot straight, you cannot go from forward to backward straight away, right? Or in the other way around, if you're going backwards, if you're driving backwards, you cannot straight, straight directly go from backwards to forward. If you're used to using a gear, you have to go to neutral first. Like, am I right? Correct. So uh, the same way it's with meditation. We go back to neutral, and in that way, we can develop good qualities like compassion, kindness, wisdom. And because our negative emotions like greed, hatred, and delusion, unrealistic perceptions, they have less impact on our mind. They have less of a grip on our mind. And because of that, we have more space to develop good qualities. Some people misunderstand that uh, Buddhism is about becoming apathic, but that is not true. With apathic, I mean, having no emotion at all. But that's not exactly true. It's just that 
we learn to have more space in our mind to develop good qualities. Now let's go back to our presentation. So uh, I explained that why we, why meditation, we have a training method and how come we can overcome suffering in that way. So when the mind becomes more clean, more clear, because greed, hatred and delusion come up less, they, then the pool of water, which is normally very murky and muddy because it moves, people step into it. Then suddenly it becomes clear because all the sediment in the pool of water is starting to sink and people will be able to see the water clearly. And these little ducks here will be able to very happily swim in a very clear pool of water. So uh, this is the way our mind works as well. Sometimes it's also compared with, uh, I think I mentioned this to you before, with a sphere which is found in, uh, in uh, souvenir shops, these kind of uh, snow globes. Do you know these? These yes. snow globes? So is it one of those snow globes? If you shake it around, it will become very cloudy you, because of all the, uh, the, the white dust that is in there. So or the white snow. And one of the, uh, from the point, from the moment you put it down in a solid, in a still place, the snow will start to sink and you can see clearly the same way our mind works like that as well. So this process we call in Buddhism, right concentration, right concentration is basically a synonym or another word for meditation. Now meditation in, 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 in the West, we started to use for Eastern practices as found in Hinduism and Buddhism, but uh, originally it's actually a Christian word. But whatever you use, the main point is that your mind becomes more clear because you start to train it. There are very, sub, very simple forms of meditation which you learn as a kid when your parents tell you to count the sheep that jump over the, what do you call it in, in English, the gate, uh, where, just to find a way to sleep. Do you do that in America? <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. You count, count the sheep jumping over the, the little gate, something like that. Or when you are angry and you learn as a kid that before, when you're angry, before you say something, please count to 10 first, or in some cases, count to 100. <laughs> <laughs> so these are simple meditations, but they are not very effective because they have not been very well developed. developed. So the meditation method that you have been practicing today can be compared to, to such simple practices, but it's more developed. It's been proved, it's been, um, uh, it's been looked at very deeply for many uh, thousands of years, for hundreds of years and two thousands of years. So these are very well developed practices, which is why in the present day, mindfulness and meditation is becoming so popular because these practices have already been practiced for a long time. So that's why some uh, people who are having a lot of influence in, mod in modern society, for example, the, the ABC journalist, Dan Harris, he said that um, meditation will become the new no brainer compared sim to brushing your teeth, which was not yet being done about a hundred years ago but these days you will find it very hard anywhere in the world to find someone who doesn't brush their teeth. So he argued that meditation would be so popular in the future as well, because it's simply a very good method to train your mind and become, make it clear without having it to, to see it, having to regard it as a, re, as a, uh, as a religious practice. It is not necessarily religious in the sense that we do not need to commit ourselves to one particular religion, but it's just, it has its origins in religion, that's all. So let's go back to our presentation. I have uh, until six, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Or do you want to ask some questions before? Uh, you, you know, you know, from now on, since I've already finished one part, did some review of last time. If you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to interrupt me, okay? If not, then I will continue until I have no more time left, okay? <laughs> uh, so I'm just continuing for the moment. So when we are meditating more, we practice our mind, we practice what is called right concentration in Buddhism. And our mind becomes brighter, more clear, happy, peaceful, powerful, cheerful, and joyful. Sometimes we also describe this uh, process as involving more than just meditation practice. And this is what we know in, in Buddhism as the seven factors that lead led to enlightenment or sometimes also known as the, um, uh, as the Eightfold Path. So if you look at from the perspective of the seven factors that led to the Buddha's enlightenment, there is seven things that help them to attain enlightenment. And these involve uh, morality, involve our mental practices and involve our wisdom. So let's first start with our wisdom. There is what we call right view, which is our perspective on life and right motivation, the way we are motivated to do something, whether it's motivated by constructive ideas, constructive intentions, or destructive intentions. Then there is right speech, right action, and right livelihood, which all involve our daily habits of our action and speech, and also our choice of occupation and how we are going to make decisions within our profession. And then there are mental habits like right effort and right mindfulness, and that the last one, which is actually where everything stops, where everything culminates, and that is right concentration. Or the, the you could say, which is the, 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 the most important factor, eventually the most ultimate factor, which led the Buddha to attain enlightenment. So right concentration is meditation. So to put it in, 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 in layman's words, or to put it in common, in, in, an, in the words that you and I use, these are all uh, practices that led the Buddha and led people like you and me to meditate better. The things we do in our daily life, the things we think, and the, the things we, we, we have as mental habits. All of these lead to one single thing, which is right concentration. And right concentration is basically meditation practice and the development within that meditation practice. You can also compare this with, um, uh, uh, you can also describe it as an eightfold path. And this is the, the path that is mostly known when you read a textbook about Buddhism or Buddhism for dummies or something, or for Buddhism for beginners or whatever then you will find these eightfold steps. Even if you go to a yoga course and you will be taught about the practices, the basic principles of yoga, then you will also be learning about an eightfold path. In fact, some forms of yoga like Astanga yoga actually comes from the same word eightfold path. So this eightfold path can also be found in yoga and most historians think that uh, the, the yoga teachers uh, uh, based themselves on Buddhism, based their uh, ideas on Buddhism. So uh, there are eight steps. And as I mentioned before, there is, we start with uh, our way of thinking, which is called wisdom. And then the action in our daily life, which is also called moral discipline. And then there's our mental habits. Now you can see that right now I've put concentration at the outside of the circle 
and it becomes a sort of full circle now. So this is how we practice ourselves in Buddhism. Whether you are Buddhist, whether you are uh, adhering to another religion or whether you are atheist, it doesn't really matter. This is a practice, this is a path that everyone can practice because it all comes down to the three basic trainings, the training of moral discipline, the mind and wisdom. Uh, so you could say that in, in, in the Buddhist perspective, ethics, uh, um, psychology and wisdom, our perspective for life, our philosophy on life, they are all interconnected. They are all connected and you cannot really separate them. You can only distinguish them. So that's why it's uh, inter interesting to learn about these different aspects of training. However, in the West, most people come mostly to learn about the training of the mind in, uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of mindfulness and concentration or mindfulness and meditation. These are the most well-known practices because these are so different from what we are familiar with in our Judeo-Christian tradition. But actually Buddhism, like any other religion or any other philosophy, has all of these practices. Uh, as as uh, ethics, there is an ethics, there is a psychology, and then there is also a philosophy of life. Are there any questions at this point? No? <laughs> so uh, I can give you some examples from these, diff these, uh, these separate parts of the Buddhist teaching, but it will be using too much time to go into much detail right now but I can continue to provide you with more detail later. For example, right livelihood in, in, in Buddhism involves not uh, uh, selling anything that is harmful for society, which is a very interesting practice. If you look at our profession, is there anything that is partly harmful or wholly harmful in our profession? When I once taught about this on a retreat in Thailand, uh, there was a French woman who later confessed to a fellow monk of mine that she was actually a producer of wine and that she was now having some, some problems with her, with her conscience about whether that was a good thing or not. Because wine can sometimes be destructive when it reaches the wrong people. So uh, it's important uh, that you understand that all of these practices are ways to reflect on our life and that helps also eventually to improve our meditation. So, so when we come down to meditate like you, or you people are doing on a regular basis, it may also be interesting to look at your own life and how the daily actions you have affect your meditation, whether positively or negatively. When you go into your car in the morning and you are cut off by somebody and you start to shout at them, you start to scold at them, then you might find your, your temper come, is not so good. Your feelings are not so good. And when you meditate, this is going to affect your meditation. Every habit that we have will eventually come together as a sort of miniature of our life in our meditation practice. But that's why it's interesting to, to learn also when we meditate about how to integrate meditation into our daily lives and also how we can adjust our lives to make meditation more easily. So in the one hand, we adjust meditation to fit into our lives. And on the other hand, we adjust our lives to fit in with meditation. These two things are, of course, no, there is no one who can tell you what to do but you have to come and find a path for yourself, every one of you, if you would like to make meditation part of your life. These are the sort of challenges which can 
which you can come across. So uh, these are some general ideas that I'd like to talk about today because the topic today was very general, very wide scope. Uh, my topic, my subject of today was a bit, perhaps a bit more uh, tedious and boring than normally, but I think it's useful to start with. Do you have any questions at this point? <laughs>